Chapter 7. Talking. On the train, all the way home, no one said a thing that wasn't a monosyllable. I tried to get mum and dad engaged in conversation, but I was flogging not just a dead horse, but a rotting one. Mum and dad had a lot to talk about, but there was no way that they were going to do it in front of me. At last we were home. I'm going to do work on my Hinkle 111. If anyone wants me, Dad didn't bother to wait around to see if anyone did want him. He headed straight into the front room and shut the door behind him. Mum watched the front door quietly close, her expression grim. I'm going to watch the news. She went into the living room. I watched in dismay as doors closed around me. This couldn't happen. Not now. I wasn't sure what to do. Unhappily, I trailed after my mum, opening the door. I saw her sitting on the sofa, staring at the TV. Mum, shall I make dinner tonight? No, I'll make it in a minute. I just want to watch the news first. Mum, co mum continued to stare at the TV. With a sigh, I turned round to go up to my room. Mum called me back. Cameron, wait. Mum stood up and slowly walked up to me. Wrapping me in a bear hug, she said, I love you. You know that, don't you? Waves of embarrassment washed over me. Get off, Mum. Mum let me go and smiled. I love you very much. I just wanted you to know. I shuffled. I know. I don't want you to think that this new baby is in any way a replacement. I know that too, I said, surprised. It's an addition, not a replacement. Besides, I'm not going anywhere. Of course you're not. Mum agreed. Just as long as he or she knows that I'm in charge, I said loftily. Uh, I think you'll find that I'm the one who's in charge, not you. Mum flicked my chin. Mum? Yes? Can I ask you a question? Mum smiled. Since when have you needed to ask if you could ask? Mum, I'm serious. Go on then. Why didn't you tell Dad that you were going to have a baby? Mum's smile vanished. She sighed deeply and sat down on the sofa again. Don't you think that should be between your father and me? She asked gently. I didn't answer. I stood still, watching. Cameron, your dad and I, we have a lot to work out. We've both had a lot on our minds lately. I didn't want to add to his concerns by telling him about the baby just yet. Doesn't he want another child? Of course he does. We both wanted another child for years, but it didn't happen. I think we'd both given up hope that it would ever happen. And when I found out I was pregnant, well, it was a bit of a shock. Are you sorry? Mum stroked her stomach tenderly. Not in the slightest. It's just unfortunate timing. I smiled. Or the best timing in the world, depending on how you look at it. You're in a half full mood, I see. Huh? Some people would describe a glass half filled with water as half full. Others would describe it as half empty. The description is meant to describe the person. If you say half full, you're an upbeat optimist. And half empty means you're a sad specimen. Mum laughed. Something like that. I grinned. So I'm a half full kind of guy. You've always, you always were and you always will be. Mum smiled. Now I'd better get dinner ready. I went to the door as Mum stood up again. Mum? Yeah? I love you too. I rushed out of the room before Mum could say another word. My face was on fire and I felt very silly. But I wanted to say it. I wanted it to say it very much. I lay in bed staring out into the darkness. It was so dark I couldn't tell where the ceiling ended and the night began. So much had happened in the space of one day. It was hard to keep it all straight and clear my mind. I was going to get my operation, but it was all top secret and hush-hush. I was going to get a heart from a pig. The faintest trace of unease stirred within me. I stared into the darkness, telling myself off. A heart was a heart, as long as it worked. I couldn't get squeamish, not now. I wanted this operation, didn't I? I wanted to run and dance and swim and do all the other things my friends did without having to weigh up the pros and cons first. I was going to get that, that chance. I was going to have the operation and live. And the icing on the cake was that mum was pregnant. 
Next April, I was going to have a brother or sister. I smiled to myself, wondering who the baby would look like. I looked more like my mum, although I had Dad's smile. But my nan said that boys who looked like their mums and girls who looked like their dads were born lucky. Maybe this was some kind of sign. I was about due for some good luck, and I had the feeling that with this operation coming up, I'd need all the good luck I could lay my hands on. My head buzzed with, a thought, uh, with thought after hopeful thought. I knew I'd never get to sleep with all the things I had on my mind. I threw back my duvet and swung my legs out of bed. A glass of orange juice would help me to sleep, and maybe one of the chicken legs that Mum had put in the fridge. Maybe a slice of gammon with some English mustard to go on with it. I could feel my mouth begin to water. I glanced at my alarm clock. It was 1.30 in the morning. Mum and Dad should be fast asleep by now. Feeling for my slippers, I put them on and tiptoed to the door and out of my room. Gingerly, I crept down the stairs. A sudden, unexpected sound from the front room froze me in my tracks. There it was again. Dad couldn't still be in there. The light was off, but, but it sounded a bit like Dad. What was going on? Why on earth was Dad sitting in the dark? I tiptoed to close to the closed front room door. What should I do now I was at the door? I could see just the faintest light seeping out from the room. Dad must have switched on his angle poised lamp rather than the main light. Very gently I opened the door. It was Dad. He sat at his table with his back towards the door. Dad, I whispered. Dad's head whipped round at the soft sound of my voice. I stared, profoundly shocked. I saw something I'd never, ever seen in my life. Something I never thought I'd see. Dad was crying. Dad? I didn't know what else to say. Embarrassed, Dad quickly wiped his tears. Dad, are you okay? I'm fine. I inwardly grimaced, a stupid question followed by a blatant lie. Go on, Cameron, off you go to bed, said Dad firmly. I wanted to stay. I desperately wanted to stay. I wanted to sit down and talk to Dad and say things. But instead I nodded and backed out of the room, closing the door carefully behind me. I headed up the stairs. I paused halfway up to look at the front room door. Then I looked up the stairs to the darkened landing. Up or down? In or out? What should I do? With a sigh, I went back up to my bedroom. My hunger for chicken and gammon had vanished. I crept into my bed and put the pillow over my head. If only the rest of the world was as easy to blot out. Chapter 8. The Announcement Cam, can I borrow your French homework? I didn't get the chance to finish mine, said Andrew. I turned to look at him. If you ever came up to me and said, Cam, I don't need to copy your homework because I've done it, I think I'd faint with shock. Oh, go on, Andrew pleaded. Here you are. I couldn't keep the long-suffering sigh out of my voice, but I want it back before the end of first lesson, understand? Andrew grinned at me. Great, thanks. Andrew, lend me Cam's homework when you're finished, said Bran. You lot could try doing your own homework instead of copying mine all the time, I said, exasperated. Why have a dog and bark yourself, Bran said. My mouth fell open. You, you certainly can't have it after that, Bran laughed. Only teasing. Yeah, right, I sniffed. The first buzzer had sounded, so we had five minutes to get to class. I looked up at the blue sky, dotted here and there with snow-white clouds. It was such a beautiful day. The morning sunshine felt warm and very welcome on my face. This was the kind of day where your slightest wish could come true. All you had to do was ask. It was just a shame we'd be, we'd be cooped up in a stuffy old classroom until break. Marlon, Andrew, Bran and I walked across the school grounds to get to class. I looked around at the other kids and grown-ups milling around. Not that I'd ever admit it to anyone, but I liked school. Julie and Nina from our class walked right in front of us, their arms linked. They were obviously posing. Why? Why do girls always talk, walk together with their arms linked? It's as if they're afraid they'll keel over if they have to stand up by themselves. Julie smiled at me. Hi, Cameron. I could feel my face begin to burn. Hi, Julie, I muttered. Guess what? I'm going to be in an ad on telly. Are you really? 
I said eagerly. What ad? When's it coming out? Next week. I'll definitely watch it. I'm not surprised, though. You're pretty enough to be on the telly. Stunned, I stared at Julie. I couldn't believe what I'd just blurted out. Where on earth had that come from? Now I, all I wanted was for a hole to open up and swallow me all the way down to New Zealand. Nina started laughing. Everyone was laughing, except Marlon. He just shook his head. He knew what I was like. Sometimes I suffered badly from foot and mouth disease. Julie was smiling at me again. Cam, I'm only pulling your leg. I just wanted to see what your reaction would be, and it was worth it. Shame, shame, shame. The word was emblazoned across the sky in huge letters and great godlike hands were coming down from it and pointing directly at me. How could I be such a, such a ginormous nit? Everyone was laughing harder than ever now. Oh, right, I mumbled. Why was I so gullible? Every time someone came up with a cock and bull story, I could swallow it, hook, line and sinker. Cam, I only pull the legs of boys I like, Julie told me softly. Pass the sick bag, Marlon scoffed. You're just jealous, Julie told him immediately. Me? I didn't know what to think. I even managed to smile at Julie, but only just. After all, she liked me. That made her teasing worth it, almost. Cam, can I borrow your maths homework? Just to check and see if I've done it right, Julie asked with a smile. Sure. I dug into my bag. It fell on the floor. I took a step forward to get it and ended up standing on it. I tried to pick it up, but suddenly my hands were all sweaty. I dropped it again. When I finally managed to pick up my bag, you could have fried two eggs on my face and they would have cooked in five seconds flat. I got my maths homework out and handed it straight to her. Can I borrow it after Julie? Marlon asked. I didn't get the chance to finish mine. How come you won't whine when Julie asks if she can borrow your homework? Bran smiled knowingly. Andrew stared at me. What maths homework? Marlon grinned. Bran, if you wore a skirt and battered your eyes at Cam, I'm sure he'd lend you his homework without a single complaint too. Bog off, both of you, I replied, my face hotter than molten lava. What maths homework? Andrew was beginning to panic now. Andrew, you can borrow it after Julie, I told him exasperated. Julie winked. Thanks, Cam. You're a real pal. I would have lent her my homework without all the lovey-dovey, gooey, gooey eyes stuff. I really liked Julie, but at that moment, all I wanted her to do was, all I wanted her to do was d disappear. She must have read my mind because she and Nina s sauntered off. You fancy Julie, don't you? Marlon teased so that I could hear him. Only I could hear him. That's a lie. Who said I did? I scowled at him. No one, but my eyeballs work just fine. She obviously likes you as well. Why don't you ask her out? I looked around quickly, but Andrew and Bram were too busy talking to hear our conversation. They were discussing how best to copy my homework. So why don't you ask her out? Marlon repeated. Shh, keep your voice down, I begged. Besides, if she says yes, I think it was because I'm ill. And if she said no, I think it was because I'm ill. Marlon gave me a look. It must be working hard being you. It is, I agreed. Oh, before I forget, here you are. I dug into my bag and took out a crumpled piece of paper. What's this? asked Marlon. The maths homework, I copied it out for you. Marlon grinned at me and snatched it out of my hand. You're welcome, I said dryly. Oh, Cameron, can I have a word? I turned my head. Sickly, Sticky Stewart, our class teacher, came running up to me. We called him Sticky behind his back because he was tall and lanky and reminded everyone of a stick. A stick insect. To be honest, I was the one who'd come up with the nickname. I'd only meant it as a joke. I hadn't expected it to take off the way it had. Yes, sir, I frowned. Can I have a word? Mr Stewart repeated. He looked pointedly at Marlon, Andrew and Bran, who were walking with me, in private. Cam, we'll see you in class, Marlon said to me, giving the teacher a suspicious look. I watched as my friends walked away before turning back to the teacher. I've heard your mum from your mum and dad that you'll be away from next week and for some considerable time. I froze. What had mum and dad said? And why hadn't they warned me first? You're going to have a heart transplant, right? I nodded. 
Would you mind if I told the rest of the class? I'm sure they'd all like to join with me in wishing you the very best of luck. What else did Mum and Dad say? I asked. Mr Stewart raised his eyebrows. That was it, really. Why? Is there anything else? No, no, I said quickly. So, can I tell the class? I shrugged. Yes, I guess so. Good, good, Mr Stewart beetled off before I had a chance to change my mind, which I was just about to do. He bounced across the school grounds with that loping, leaping walk of his, and I knew that even if I ran after him, I'd never catch up with him.